Hello and good morning friends welcome to the CC Edusit live lecture dear friends with our ongoing series on uh, microeconomics uh, today we would be talking on bemol's theory of uh, sales revenue maximization in the first session whereas in the second half we would be discussing on marginal productivity theory of distribution and for this very discussion we have once again with us in our studios dr kamlesh ghakkar dr kamlesh ghakkar is a professor in institute of management uh, studies and research uh, mdu rohtak that is uh, mahesh dayanand university rohtak we would like to tell you all that uh, dr ghakkar has immense experience she has authored numerous books as well as as uh, uh, many of her articles have been published in reputed journals uh, uh, many of our uh, students are uh, pursuing a phd under her able guidance so let's welcome our guest dr kamlesh ghakkar dr kamkar ghakkar welcome to the edusit lecture thank you dear viewers today we are going to discuss about the baumol's theory of sales revenue maximization we have already done that in the traditional theory profit maximization was considered as the main objective of a firm but according to baumol due to the separation of ownership from management managers pursue other goals like in improving or maximizing their own utility and that is why he said that sales revenue maximization is the main goal of the firms so it is an important alternative to profit maximization and baumol has given several justifications of the sales revenue as a goal of the firm baumol has been a consultant to a member of american firms and observed that managers are generally preoccupied with the maximization of the sales rather than profits several reasons seem to explain this attitude of top management firstly there is evidence that salaries and other earnings of top managers are most clo most closely related to sales rather than profits secondly banks and other financial institutions are impressed by the sales of a firm and are more willing to finance firms with large and growing sales thirdly personal problems can be handled more satisfactorily satisfactorily when sales are growing the employees at all levels can be given higher earnings and better terms of work in general declining sales lead to reduction in the salaries of the employees and layoff of some employees resulting in dissatisfaction and uncertainty among personals at all levels fourthly growing sales give prestige to managers while large profits go into the pockets of shareholders fifthly a steady performance with satisfactory amount of profits is preferable to spectacular profits in one or two periods which are difficult to maintain over long periods sixthly large growing sales strengthen the competitive power of the firm vis-a-vis -vis its rivals while a low or declining sales diminish its bargaining power so on the basis of all these points it was considered that sales revenue maximization is the goal which is taken up by the firm now what are the assumptions of baumol's model and now we are going to talk about his static model some of the assumptions are the time horizon of a firm is a single period during this period the firm attempts to maximize the total sales revenue rather than physical volume of sales secondly 
total sales revenue is subject to a minimum profit constraint which is exogenously determined by the expectations of the shareholders the banks and other financial institutions the firm must realize a minimum level of profits to keep shareholders happy and avoid a fall of the prices of shares on the stock exchange if share prices decline managers run the risk of losing their jobs conventional cost and revenue functions are assumed that is baumol accepts that cost curves are u shaped and demand curve faced by a firm is downward sloping now how the price and output is determined in baumol's model so firstly we'll take the case when no advertising is there conventional cost and revenue curves are shown in figure 1 total revenue is maximum at the highest point of the tr curve where the elasticity of demand is unity and the slope of tr curve which is mr is zero whether this sales revenue will be realized or not depends upon the level of minimum acceptable profit which may act as a constraint to the activity of the firm a profit maximizing firm would produce the output om1 which is shown in figure 1 on x axis we have shown output on y axis cost revenue and profit are shown tr curve starts from zero and it goes on increasing at a decreasing rate it becomes maximum at point j and after that it has started declining and total cost curve is starting from y axis and then it is rising at a decreasing rate and ultimately at an increasing rate so that is the shape of total cost and total revenue and these are conventional cost and conventional revenue curves now the point j is the point of sales revenue maximization because here total revenue is maximum and here the marginal revenue is zero or slope of tr is zero and we know when mr is zero elasticity of demand is equal to one at this point so according to this point the output produced by a sales maximizer firm is om3 but actually this output will be produced or not it depends upon the minimum profit constraint and we have to see whether that is operative or not firstly we take that the output is om1 when the profit is maximum and this is the objective of a profit maximizing firm here the total profit is o pi m this is the maximum profit a firm can get so a profit maximizing firm would produce om1 output now if the profit constraint is o pi 1 dash then you see that this constraint is non operative why because at this the profit constraint is less than the profit at the level of sales revenue maximization it is more than o pi s m so at when the profit constraint is o pi 1 the firm will produce the output o m 3 which is the sales revenue maximization point so when this is non operative 
OM3 output is being done. But if the profit constraint is O pi 2, you see here that this profit is more than the O pi SM, the profit at sales maximizing point. So, this constraint is operative profit constraint and you see here that at this level the output produced by a sales maximizing firm would be OM2. So, you see here that OM2 is greater than OM1. So, the sales maximizing firm would produce more than a profit maximizing firm and the price charged by the sales maximizing firm would be less than that of the charged by the profit maximizing firm. You can find out the price by dividing TR by the output by dividing the total TR by the output produced you can find out what is the price charged by a firm. Now we will see the other model which is the model with advertising. You know advertising is very essential in case of oligopoly market. You know there is too much competition among the sellers and instead of cutting the price and entering into price wars, they resort to or they undertake advertising expenditure to attract more and more customers. So, now we will see whether the advertisement outlay is more or less when the firm has the objective of sales maximization. So, this uh, advertising model is also based on certain assumptions. Number one is the goal of the firm is sales revenue maximization subject to a minimum profit constraint which is exogenously determined. So, here also the firm would maximize sales revenue, but a minimum profit constraint is essential or minimum profits are essential to keep the shareholders happy. Secondly, advertising is a major instrument or you can say it is a policy variable of the firm. It is assumed that sales revenue increases with advertising expenditure. This implies that advertising will always shift the demand curve of the firm to the right. So, here it is assumed that whenever advertisement is done, it is going to increase the demand for the commodity. When the demand rises, naturally there will be more sales and more sales will bring more revenue. So, it is thought that there is always a positive relationship between advertisement and revenue obtained from the sale of the commodity. Another assumption is price is assumed to be constant. Price is not changed because it would lead to price wars. So, instead of cutting the prices, advertisement is being done to attract more and more customers. So, a firm in the oligopolistic market will prefer to increase its sales by advertising rather than by a cut in price. It will pay the maximize, sales maximizer to increase his advertisement expenditure until he is stopped by the profit constraint. The minimum profit constraint is always operative when advertising is introduced in the model. The sales revenue maximizer will spend more on advertisement as compared to the profit maximizer. This will be shown or this is being shown in the figure 2. So, in figure 2 on x axis we have depicted advertising outlay. On y axis we have shown cost, revenue and 
profits. C C dash is the production cost, which is independent of the advertisement cost. That cost is already there. Production has been done, so this is the cost. And to this is added the advertisement cost. Ad advertisement cost function has been shown as 45 degree line to know that whether we see on the horizontal axis or we see on the vertical axis, it will show the same amount. Now, when we add this advertisement cost to the total production cost, we get the total cost curve. So, it will be parallel to the advertisement cost line of 45 degree. So, this is the line total cost curve. And so far as total revenue is concerned, it will be rising and but it will not start falling because it has been assumed that MR is positive or advertisement always leads to increase in the revenue of the firm. So, we have shown TR to be rising, no doubt the rise uh, may be less, but it will never be negative. So, now we will see what is the difference between total revenue and total cost to know the profits of the firm. To find out the profit curve, we draw TR minus TC. You know, at zero level, there is some cost due to the fixed cost, etc. So, there are negative profits at zero level of output, and we get this total profit curve starting from the negative, then it is uh, rising, it becomes zero, it goes on increasing, and at point O m pi, the difference between TR and TC is highest. And it could have been drawn by drawing tangents to TR and TC and where they become parallel that shows the highest distance between TR and TC. This has also been uh, discussed in other uh, earlier lectures also, how we find out where the difference between TR and TC is maximum. And after that it goes on declining, then again it becomes 0 and after some output will become negative. Now, you can see that profit is maximum when the output is O m pi and uh, this is not, not the output rather it is advertising outlay. So, advertising outlay in case of a profit maximizing firm is O m pi, but in case of the sales revenue maximizing firm, we will have to take into account the profit constraint, because minimum profits are essential to be attained. So, here you can see that we have shown the profit constraint as O pi dash and this line is parallel to x axis. Thus, these profits must be there at all level of advertising outlay. Now, you can see where this line is cutting the profit curve. It is cutting here and you see here that the advertisement outlay here is O M S and it is clear from the figure that O M S is greater than O M pi. So, from this diagram it must have been clear to you that a sales maximizing firm would spend more on advertisement rather than a profit maximizing firm because by increasing the advertisement it can increase the demand for its product and when demand goes on rising sales go on rising. And every day we experience this that a large number of firms are going in for sales revenue 
maximization and you see advertisement uh, in newspapers, advertisement on TV on there are so many uh, medias where you see that advertisement is there and this is necessary for the oligopolistic firms because they want to increase their sales. They do not want to have the maximum profits as the aim or as their goal, but some minimum profits must be there. Now, we will see what happens when there is a change in the overhead costs of a firm. Overhead costs are like the cost uh, or just like the fixed costs. You know fixed cost do not change the marginal cost of the firm, but the total cost do change with the increase in the fixed cost. So, we have seen how the profit curve is drawn by making the difference between TR minus TC and when TC changes supposing the output is the same, but the total cost has increased by the fixed cost or so that will see that the total profit curve will be new one and which will be parallel to the earlier one because the difference between the two curves will remain same because the fixed cost is the same at all levels of output. In the traditional theory of the firm when the profit maximization is the goal you will see that this type of firms will not have to change the output because the profit maximizing point will remain same output will be the same. But in case of the sales maximizing firm you will see that they will have to reduce the output and when output is reduced uh, they will increase the price also. This we have shown in the figure. In figure 3, in figure 3 output is shown on x axis and on y axis we have shown the total profit. Pi 1 is the first profit curve you know it starts from negative becoming 0 increasing maximum and then it has started declining and O pi dash is the minimum profit constraint. So, we have drawn this line pi dash pi dash as the profit constraint. The profit maximizing firm will produce where the profit is maximum. So, it is the output O m and when there is change uh, and at this point when there is no uh, increase in the fixed cost you can see that the sales maximizing firm is producing O m 2 units uh, O m 1 not O m 2 it is O m 1 units of the output. Output is more in case of sales maximizing firm we have already seen it. Now, when the overhead costs are increased then naturally the profit of the firm will decline and it will be at all levels of output by the same amount. So, you have seen that we have drawn pi 2 and the this is parallel to the earlier one and it is at the lower level that profits have fallen. Now, the profit maximizing point remain the same and so the output produced by profit maximizing firm is OM which is constant it was the previous level of output and new lo level of output is also the same. But so far as the sales maximizing firm is concerned you see now this profit line is cutting not at OM2 level uh, not at OM1 level it is cutting to the left of it. Now the output produced will be OM2 instead of OM1. So, what do you see here that due to the increase in overhead costs the sales maximizing firm will produce less output and it will charge more for the commodity. So, this was the impact of overhead costs. 
Now we will see about the critical evaluation of sales maximizing model. You know no theory is without criticism. If it has some good points there are some drawbacks also. So, we will see what are the defects of sales maximization model. Number one is the sales maximization hypothesis cannot be tested against competing behavioral hypothesis unless the demand and cost conditions of individual firms are measured. And we know such data are not disclosed by the firms and are commonly unknown to the firms. If we do not know the demand and cost conditions naturally how can we draw total revenue curve and total cost curve and find out what is the output being done by the sales maximization firm. But it is very difficult to know the demand and cost functions of firms. In the long run sales maximization and profit maximization hypothesis yield identical solutions. In the long run firms earn normal profits and the minimum profit constraint is very much likely to coincide with it. So, sometimes the result is the same profit maximizing firm no doubt wants to maximize the profits, but in the long run there are only normal profits for a firm and uh, there is a possibility and that normal profit is equal to the minimum profit constraint. In that case there will be no difference uh, between the activity or the price and output determination by a sales maximizing firm as well as profit maximizing firm. The sales maximization theory does not show how equilibrium in a industry in which all firms are sales maximizer will be attained. Baumol did not establish the relationship between firm and industry. You know in the industry there are a large number of firms. So, Baumol talked about only of the equilibrium of the firm, it did not mention the equilibrium of the industry. This theory is unrealistic as it ignores the actual competition and threat of potential competition. It has ignored the interdependence among oligopolistic firms. The assumption that MR of advertising is positive is not justified by Baumol. It is not necessary that every time the advertisement is going to increase the sales. Ex -ex excessive advertisement may repel the persons, the P persons may not like the commodity and there may be not the positive response uh, due to the increase in the advertisement, the sales may fall even or they may not increase. So, we cannot say that MR is always positive in relation to the advertisement. So, this the possibility of MR being negative in response to the increase in advertisement outlay cannot be ruled out. So, thus we see that the sales maximizing model explains that a firm has the objective of sales maximization rather than profit maximization and to some extent we find that this is being in operation in today's scenario. Thank you.
Dear viewers, in this lecture, I am going to explain the marginal productivity theory of distribution. Till now, we have seen how the prices of commodities are determined. We have seen what are the factors affecting demand for a commodity, how the supply is determined and how prices are determined in different markets. Now, we come to the question of price determination of factors of production. We know there are four factors land, labor, capital and entrepreneur. In every production we need these four factors. Now we have to see how their prices are determined. You know rent is the price for land, wages are the price for labor, interest is the price for capital and profit is the price for entrepreneur. Now, how these prices are determined? There are two main theories. One is the marginal productivity theory of distribution and the other is modern theory of factor pricing. So, now we are going to see what is marginal productivity theory of distribution. Now, firstly we should know why we study the theory of factor pricing. Factor prices constitute an important determinant of money incomes. Factor prices allocate scarce resources among various industries and firms. Factor prices play an important role in choosing optimum factor input ratio to maximize profits. Study of factor pricing is also necessary on account of various subjective considerations relating particularly to ethical questions and policy issues. Demand for factors of production is an indirect or derived demand as it is based on the demand for goods produced. If the demand for a product rises, demand for factors of production also increases. Now, <coughs> actually demand for a factor of production is the derived one that is not the direct one. Now, what this theory says marginal productivity theory of distribution was propounded by J. B. Clark and he gave this theory in his book The Distribution of Wealth published in 1899. It was simultaneously developed and perfected by Alfred Marshall, Stanley Jevons, Wicksteed and some other economists. According to this theory, in equilibrium each productive agent will be rewarded in accordance with its marginal productivity as measured by the effect of addition or withdrawal of a unit of that agent on the total product, quantity of other agents being held constant. The essence of this theory is that 
price of a factor of production depends upon its marginal productivity. It also seems very fair and just that price of a factor should be according to its contribution to the total output or its marginal product. So, marginal productivity theory says that every factor should be paid according to its marginal productivity. Now, what is the marginal productivity and what are the three concepts attached to it? There are mainly three concepts. One is marginal physical productivity, other is value of marginal product and the third one is marginal revenue productivity. Now, what is the marginal physical product? Marginal physical product refers to the addition in total physical production brought about by employing one more unit of a factor of production. So, MPP of nth unit is equal to TPP or total physical productivity of n units minus total physical productivity of n minus 1 units. For example, when two laborers are working in a farm, production of wheat is 10 quintals and when an other labor is employed on the same farm, production rises to 14 quintals. Then MPP or marginal physical productivity of the third laborer is 14 minus 10 is equal to 4 quintals of wheat. Now, what is the marginal revenue product? Marginal revenue product is equal to marginal physical productivity into marginal revenue or you can say just as in the earlier example, your MPP is 4, it will be multiplied by the marginal revenue. And in case of value of marginal product VMP, this is equal to MPP into AR or you know AR is the price. So, value of marginal product is marginal physical productivity into price of the commodity. When there is perfect competition in the market, we know that average revenue is equal to marginal revenue. So, in that case, value of marginal product will be the same as the marginal revenue product. Both will be equal because average revenue and marginal revenue are equal. You have seen that in the uh, perfect competition, the demand curve faced by a firm was a line or demand curve was perfectly elastic. This was a line parallel to x axis and this price is equal to MR also. So, VMP and MRP are found to be the same in case of perfectly competitive market in the case of products. Now, this theory is based on many assumptions which are as Number one is a completely static society characterized by constant population, constant amount of available capital and unchanging productive technology. Second is there is perfect competition in both goods market and factor market. When there is perfect competition in goods market, you know that AR is equal to MR because of the large number of buyers and sellers, neither the buyer nor the seller has any control over the price of the commodity. Similarly, in factor market, for, for example, we take the case of labor market. In that case, we see that average wage is equal to the marginal wage and this wage rate is determined in the industry by the intersection of demand for and supply of the labor and a firm cannot control the wage rate. All units of the variable factor are homogeneous, they are of the same quality and they are 
perfectly mobile as mobile they can move from one firm to another one industry to another this is also the assumption then technical coefficients of production are not fixed this means that the input ratio is variable we can uh, go on changing the variable factor or we can go on increasing the variable factor keeping the other factors constant so the input ratio will go on changing if the input ratio is fixed we can't increase the one factor alone so it is assumed that the fixed ratio is not there rather it is variable law of diminishing returns we have already done in earlier lecture law of diminishing returns which says that as we go on employing more and more of the variable factor its marginal productivity goes on declining and we talk of the long run in the long run we know all factors can be varied no doubt but here we are talking uh, the case of long run that in the long run the firms are getting only normal profits another is about the rational employer rationality of the employer is that he wants to maximize profits every firm wants to maximize profits so it will employ labor up to the point where the marginal revenue productivity of the labor is equal to the marginal fixed cost or marginal wage of labor so these two conditions are met then the firm is getting maximum profits now we'll explain this theory to maximize his profits from the given stock of capital an entrepreneur will go on employing labor till the marginal revenue product of labor becomes equal to the wage rate thus equilibrium will be reached at a point where wage rate is just equal to the marginal product of labor this is shown in figure 1 in figure 1 labor is depicted on x axis and marginal product of labor is shown on y axis marginal revenue productivity is declining because there is law of diminishing returns as we are employing more and more labor marginal revenue productivity goes on declining and ow is the wage rate which is determined in the industry and every firm has to pay this wage rate so on the basis of this wage rate a firm has to take the decision regarding how many units of labor will be employed so you see here this wage line is cutting mrp at point e at this is the point of equilibrium at this point n e is the marginal revenue product of labor this mrp is also equal to vmp because we have taken the assumption of perfect competition so at this point wage ow is equal to ne so on number of laborers are employed by the firm when the wage rate is ow now if the employment is done less instead of on units if the firm employs om1 laborer so what do you see here that at this level of employment the marginal revenue productivity is n1 e1 while the wage rate is n1 g so the firm is not getting the maximum profit this is the loss e1 g e is the loss to the firm so why should it have such a loss it can increase the employment to on where wage rate becomes equal to marginal revenue productivity and profits are maximum and if it employs more laborer o n 2 then you see here at this level 
N to H is the wage rate while marginal revenue productivity is N to E2. So, marginal revenue productivity is less, wages are more. So, this also uh, gives loss to the firm. So, the total loss will be E, E2, H. So, you see that only E is the point of equilibrium to the left of it or to the right of it. There are losses to the firm. So, the firm maximizes profits only at the point where wages are equated to the marginal revenue productivity of the labor or you can say of any factor. We will see what is the marginal revenue productivity of that factor when it becomes equal to the marginal factor cost that will be the equilibrium level of employment of that factor. Now, how the wage rate is determined? In the earlier figure, we showed that wage rate was OW. From where did it come? So, for this purpose, we have to see how the wage rate is determined. A marginal product schedule or curve shows a particular wage employment relationship. Due to the assumption of static society, total supply of labor available for employment in the whole economy is given and constant. Aggregate supply curve of labor is taken as perfectly inelastic. It has been assumed that there is full employment. Full employment means all those who are willing to work at the going wage rate, they have got employment. The persons who are willingly unemployed, they are not called unemployed. So, given the aggregate amount of labor that is seeking employment, wage rate will be equal to the marginal product of labor. The wage rate is determined by the marginal product of a given quantity of labor force. This has been shown in figure 2. DD curve represents the demand curve for labor by all the employers or by all the firms and has been obtained by the horizontal summation of marginal product curves of all the employers demanding labor. If the available supply of labor is ON in the whole economy, then marginal productivity of labor at this level is NE and wage rate OW will be equal to NE. You can see this in figure 2. In figure 2, labor is depicted on x axis and on y axis we have shown marginal product and wage rate. We know that marginal productivity curve goes on declining and actually this is the demand curve of the for the labor by all the firms together in the industry. So, it has been formed by summation of marginal productivity curves faced by all the employers. So, if marginal productivity is falling, summation is also of this shape. Now, we have taken that the total amount of labor is given and we have taken it supposing it is O n labor force who are willing to work at the going wage rate. So, if the level of employment which is full employment O n, then at this level you see that marginal productivity is n e. So, the wage rate will be fixed equal to n e. So, this will be O w. So, O w wage rate is determined on the basis of the marginal productivity curve. If more wages are given 
to the labor or wage rate is higher than ow if it is ow1 then you see that employment falls to on1 so here n and 1 would be the unemployment in the economy due to the increased wage rate so this says that if wage rate rises there will be fall in un there will be fall in employment and if ow2 wage rate is given instead of ow so this wage rate is less and you see here that now the demand for labor rises to on2 while the labor force is on but demand is on2 so actually if the wage rate is kept more or high ultimately it will be unstable and it would lead to the establishment of the rate ow why because if the wage rate is ow 1 you see that there will be unemployment and due to unemployment labor will compete among each other and uh, they would like to have jobs so this would bring down the wage rate to ow and if ow2 wage rate is fixed there is more demand then the firms will like to attract more labor by giving more wages so ow is the only equilibrium wage rate and it is stable wage rate because at this point wage rate is equal to the marginal productivity of labor or demand is equal now you have seen that there is a, a negative relationship between wage rate and employment and now we'll see what is the criticism against the marginal productivity theory number one is it is based on unrealistic assumptions you see many assumptions have been there in this theory like static society perfect competition perfect mobility of factors equal bargaining power of buyers and sellers and perfect knowledge but in real life these assumptions are not found you see that in the product market as well as in the factor market there is no perfect competition rather imperfect competition and economy is not stat static population is rising technology is changing so how can we say that the society is static and wage rate is determined on the basis of this assumptions buyers and sellers don't have the equal bargaining powers sometimes uh, sellers are having more bargaining power sometimes buyers have more bargaining power so all these assumptions and uh, perfect knowledge is not there sellers are not uh, aware of everything in the similar way buyers don't know what are the prices so all these unrealistic assumptions naturally will lead to wrong conclusions second is it is unable to explain the determination of factor price under conditions of imperfect competition in the factor and product markets there is imperfect competition in the product market in that case average revenue is not equal to the marginal revenue marginal revenue is less than average revenue in case of imperfect competition and if this is there you know vmp which is mpp into ar and mrp which is equal to mpp into mr will not be equal vmp would be greater than mrp and if the wages are equal to mrp this means there is exploitation of labor and when there is imperfect competition in the factor market average wage is not equal to marginal wage marginal wage is higher than average wage but actually laborers are paid average wage which is less than the marginal marginal wage so there is exploitation of labor 
due to imperfection in the both markets which has not been considered by marginal productivity theory of distribution. Another criticism is regarding that it has taken that the input ratio is always variable, but sometime there is a fixed ratio that we have to combine a labor and capital or two factors in a fixed ratio. In that case, if you increase only one factor without increasing the other, then marginal productivity of the variable factor will be zero. So, according to this theory, the factor should be paid zero rate or zero remuneration, but that is absurd. So, this is also one of the criticism. Another criticism is ignorance of the bargaining power of trade unions. This theory says that if wages are increased, there would be unemployment and it has, uh, it has said that the trade unions are futile, uh, they cannot lead to rise in the wage rate. But you know that trade unions are quite strong and when they demand higher wages for the laborer, there is no unemployment. Then effect of wages on productivity. This theory says that wages are determined according to marginal productivity, but actually wages also affect marginal productivity. You can think that if laborers are paid good wages, higher wages, they can have a better standard of living, they can have good health and they will be motivated to work more. They will have incentive to work more as well as they will be healthy enough to work more. So, higher wage rate would lead to higher productivity which has been ignored in this theory. Another is entrepreneur may not be rational. We have assumed here that entrepreneur is always rational, he always wants to maximize profits, but it may also not be there. Sometimes uh, some firms uh, may be giving wages more than the marginal revenue productivity. In some cases, they may be giving uh, less wages as compared to the marginal revenue productivity. So, it is not necessary that the employer is always rational. Then there is a difficulty in measuring marginal productivity of labor. Marginal productivity can be measured only if only one factor is varied and other factors are kept constant. But you see whenever any labor is employed, he is given some equipment, uh, he is provided other factors of production also, only then he can work and contribute to the output. So, when different factors are employed, how can we know what is the productivity of one factor? So, it is very difficult to measure marginal productivity and when it cannot be measured, how can we determine the factor price according to it. Another is the product exhaustion problem uh, that is that if all the factors are paid according to the marginal uh, productivity, then whether the total product will be exhausted or not. If there are increasing returns to scale, then total product will be less than the payment done to all the factors of production according to marginal productivity. And if the marginal revenue productivity is declining or we are having decreasing returns to scale, then you will see that the total product will not be exhausted. So, this problem also arises. Then in case of entrepreneurs, how can we find out the marginal productivity? You know, there is one entrepreneur in one firm. If we employ another entrepreneur, naturally there would through two persons cannot work together. Entrepreneur is always one. So, we cannot employ other one. How can we find out the marginal productivity of the entrepreneur? Then this theory is not comprehensive because it does not give importance to the power structure, social conventions, social status and prestige of a group of workers in the determination of remuneration of various groups or classes of labor force. This theory cannot explain remuneration discrimination between men and women, between races and between social classes. This theory takes into account only the demand side. The marginal productivity theory as propounded by J. B. Clark considered only the demand for a factor and ignored the supply side in the factor market. 
but supply is equally important in the determination of factor prices. So, marginal productivity theory does not explain fully the determination of all factor prices, but still it is a very very important economic factor governing the prices of factor because this says that every factor is contributing something to the output and if the factor is paid according to its marginal productivity and that would be just. So, dear students this was about the marginal productivity theory of distribution. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much. Uh, dear friends, you can post your feedback at info.cc at the written IC dot in. Your feedbacks are very, very important for uh, us. So, you can see all the lectures pertaining to the series Microeconomics. As all, the lectures are already there for you on YouTube. This lecture is also going to be uploaded on YouTube very soon. So, keep watching us. Keep writing us. We would be meeting again tomorrow and would be discussing on another topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you ma'am. Thank, Thank you so very much. You.